Hello everyone and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gauthier Lamotte, your host, and today my guest is Rohan Anda, and he is a very important person at Miston Labs, Head of Strategic Partnerships and Investments. Hi Rohan, nice to have you here. Hey, good to meet you, Gauthier. And uh, just a point on that, uh, I wouldn't emphasize too much on the important person, but I love working with people who are building important things uh, ah. using technology. So we're going to talk in this episode quite a lot about the important things you guys are building. Uh, first question that I like to use as an icebreaker, how did you come in contact with the blockchain industry yourself? I, I don't even know where to begin with this one. Um, to jog my memory here a little bit. Um, so this was almost about a decade ago mm -hmm. um, when I just had kicked off my professional career in consulting and management consulting. Um, and one of my colleagues brought to me the Ethereum white paper and basically asked me, hey, you have an engineering background, right? Can you help me decipher what's written in this white paper? I would love to brainstorm on the idea. Um, so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll look at it after my nine to five at that point. <laughs> and uh, once I went home, started reading about it, it just was an aha moment for me uh, just mind you, like the Ethereum paper back at that time, it wasn't anything very technical, very complex. It was just a bunch of ideas thrown in on a website and a simple like a uh, few pages of paper. Like this is what we are trying to do and this is how we are going to build sort of a new internet. Um, and I was kind of hooked because my friend was right. Yes, I had an engineering background and I love tinkering with things and I love building new technologies. Um, and I just kept going into the rabbit hole trying to explore what this blockchain technology is. And since then, I have never really looked, looked back. How long ago was that? This is 2014, 2015 time frame. Okay, that's, uh, you're already celebrating your decade in this game. Almost, or... yeah. <laughs> so nowadays, what is it that you do, what you guys do at Miston Labs? What are the projects you guys work on? Yeah, so uh, Miston Labs is um, the launch partner for SUI, uh, the L1 blockchain that utilizes Move programming language. Um, part of Mistin's mandate is to help grow the ecosystem and bring in builders and creators um, that are excited about blockchain as a technology and onboarding millions and billions of users um, by providing them access to security, uh, privacy, uh, custodianship of their data, uh, self-sovereignty. Um, and the mandate here for me at Mission Labs is focused uh, on builders and ventures in the space who are leveraging non-fungible token as a technology standard and building new products, whether it be in commerce, whether it be in gaming, rewards, loyalty, uh, even PFPs, art, um, or any other utility that comes with, with it. Allow me to rebound on one uh, of the things you said. You talked about custody. So uh, these days there's a huge debate about self-custody. Uh, should you be allowed to, uh, to hold your own funds on a wallet? Uh, how do payment solutions you know, process payments uh, by, being, you know, by keeping self-custody? So the, for our listeners, the idea that your coins are still on your own wallet and not on a third party. Um, how hard is it for you guys to uh, to encourage this in this industry these days? Because over the past two, three years, I've seen many, many um, companies providing blockchain services and, you know, building blockchain tech kind of self-compromise because of the regulatory framework and basically saying, okay, we have custody of your funds now and, uh, um, well, we could, you know, we could seize your funds if we wanted to. So uh, how hard is it for a company such as yours to, to encourage this in, uh, in their own projects or in the projects you guys support? Yeah, and I'll give you my personal opinion because obviously um, I think the views differ from an ecosystem to ecosystem. And the reason I say is in the short term, because of the limit, limitation that the technology offers and what we're trying to do, the narrative around self-custody becomes important, uh, primarily because the reason we have, we had Bitcoin and then the blockchain technology and all of that was because of the centralization aspects uh, that the large financial institutions, banks, uh, large tech giants um, we're custodying our data, our money, 
um, and to some extent more really accountable or the incentives with the end users and uh, the institutions were not aligned, right? They were all making money and revenue, the ROI, but none of it was getting passed down to the end user. So that's where the genesis of your data or uh, assets being self-custodied versus I uh, was saying with some centralized party uh, becomes comes to comes to life. But the challenge with that narrative is quite plain and simple. I think as it's good when you have small number of users who are the early technocrats and adopters of this technology believe in like, okay, we should have data being stored with us. We should be, uh, you know, storing self custodying all the assets that we have. But we know that human behavior is, is counter, uh, counteracts that very sentiment because there's only so much data, so much financial assets we want to be responsible for, right? If you, just rewind a little bit. We had floppy disks. We had, uh, uh, you know, compact disks, the CDs. Yes. We had uh, USB drives, and we were storing all of that information. All the games, all the movies, all the music was with us. But sooner and later, we decided there was too much of it, and we needed a better solution so that we don't become the custodians of creating our own mixtapes or our mix CDs. Or whoever that may be and we'll see a similar trend happening in crypto as well while now it is it makes sense to be storing all of that data because primarily this is financial information that we are storing we will start looking at centralized custodians who are parking those assets on uh, on on our behalf because at some point things start getting overwhelming we might see a similar like um, uh, the cloud services or the Google Drives or the Dropbox of the world that taking place. And they could all be decentralized, if you will, but we won't be the one uh, custodying all of that data. We may have the email password equivalent of Web2, uh, which would be a public private key, but that's as far as it goes, right? Because uh, uh, otherwise the, it just overwhelms users beyond imagination and we're starting to see that play out in real life too. So you mean because of the of the lack of you know, of will to be, to get technically educated or to supervise everything manually, there will necessarily be providers of custody because that's a service such as any other, just like any other service, right? Right. Similar to like how many verticals we have. We have gaming, we have financial services, we've got your fan engagements, you have all your e-commerce platforms, we leverage it. How many of those things you want to manage if every single asset you're storing it on your wallet? You want someone else to be doing it on your behalf so that you don't have to think about it because what becomes even more valuable in the near future are two things. One, your attention span. We are getting into hyper mode into attention economy. And the other is convenience. That is always going to be front and center. And without those, if those two are not solved, like uh, that, I, I don't see how self, uh, self custody would not fly at all. Yeah, some people tell me, yeah, there's a different uh, Web3 is either going to be AI driven or blockchain driven. And I think it's going to be 80-20 in favor of AI because people just want convenience and AI brings more convenience than um, than the freedom given by, by Web3. So there's probably going to be a, uh, be a mix of those two techs. But I strongly believe yeah. that AI is going to be the, the dominant one because of the... Um, of, of the convenience aspect you were talking about. And so what is the project you guys are the most proud of? Um, at Mr. Natsui? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I guess so. Um, I think some uh, history is required. So just to give your audience a little bit of background. So Sui uh, has been live on the mainnet for only for the past nine, 10 months. Mm -hmm. So we are a relatively new baby as it, as it will in the crypto and the blockchain ecosystem. Um, so we have a growing ecosystem. Um, so uh, that means, but we are competing against some of the big heavyweights in this case, right? Your Solanas and the Ethereums and uh, your Immutables and a bunch of other uh, uh, L1s trying to go after the same pool of individuals, uh, right? It's slowly expanding. Um, uh, ecosystem, uh, the wallets, the mindshare. Um, so the projects that are very exciting to us at the moment is like within the DeFi space. We have some of the projects from uh, who are building solely on some of the other chains are starting to move on to um, Sui 
as an example. Uh, not because of anything else, but the developer experience is phenomenal, right? A tech stack comes second to none. So developers and the builders are choosing Sui as a chain to build on compared to everyone else is because how smooth the process is uh, to build on Sui, right? And that creates that snowball effect because mm -hmm. once developers and builders start coming to life, so like Bluefin, Blue Move, um, we have uh, some of other DeFi projects going live like Scala, Navi, uh, that's bringing a, a ton of perp and dex volume onto chain so that provides us a great liquidity set and volume on chain some of the next challenges that we are going to be solving for is like bringing in more users more utility whether it be around onboarding new gaming users and a chain which is one of our uh, biggest partners uh, is is building with us leveraging our dynamic nft technology our kiosk and continuously building uh, their entire tech stack using Sui's architecture which is phenomenal because you previously the uh, market sentiment was like gaming developers or gaming publishers they don't want to build on web3 because everything is just monetized and you know <laughs> everything is just all about money but that sentiment is changing and we are enabling uh that um so we're excited about some of those partnerships we are obviously uh partners with red bull the formula one team uh, we have demonstrated through our technology some amazing new ways of minting NFTs, onboarding new sets of users through account abstracted wallets, where all the user had to do was launch, uh, sorry, uh, mint their NFTs using their Gmail account without ever having to see what's happening behind the scene at the wallet level. The same security and privacy is provided as you would have on your uh, uh, mnemonic wallets, but without the user ever having to see the back end of it. And that's where the future is going. And our yeah. first and foremost um, uh, uh, thought process is around how do we onboard the next set of users as easily as possible. And our feature sets on chain standards are designed to solve for exactly that. You know, it's funny. It reminds me the the, the, the all the business models that are revolving around three parties like B two B two C, such as Airbnb. Usually. The end user is crucial because you have to keep stuff lazy for uh, and comfortable for the, the end user. But you also have to draw the attention of the mid user. And in Airbnb, it was very hard to convince the people. It was easy to convince the users, telling them, OK, you're going to pay three times less for a cool apartment with a view which allows you to see the sea yes of course that's going to be cool and in exchange you just sleep on somebody's on, on somebody's bed but for the mid users you had to tell them okay so you're going to give your keys to to your house to somebody you didn't meet you don't know that person you haven't met that person and you know what you're going to like it and get paid for it and that's the kind of things that happen in video games as well they they said okay there were many video game consoles that were great but so hard uh, in terms of development that most people didn't risk it and didn't want to to develop games on it so in the end the better product was not the the most technically advanced it was the one that was the simplest for for the people building stuff on it so right i, I really like the spirit and do you think that uh that that's a trend um all the blockchains should follow or would there be a reason to have elitist blockchains for very specific business use cases um you know just like there are still people using linux distributions where everything has to be done manually everything is complicated but when you get the hang of it there's there are quite a lot of re uh, quite many reasons to to still use that for specific use cases do you do you have ideas in mind uh, where the blockchain industry would ha would experience the same thing yeah i i think it's very easy for us to forget how trends develop, how technology evolves, mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes it happens slowly and then suddenly, right? And to, to compare like very recent examples, like credit cards, mm -hmm. uh, even PayPal for that matter, people were scared of putting their private information, their PI information, even swiping their card. People who were, you know, now we go to a gas station or a McDonald's to get like a dollar burger, we don't even think about it to swipe for even for one dollar purchases we use our credit card or debit card back then people were like oh we're never going to be using our credit card or debit card for a dollar purchase the credit cards and debit cards are used for like a bigger purchase yeah a thousand that's where the, right a thousand we're going for like um i don't know a amex came out and they were like okay travel rewards and you can book your airline and fly flight all right that that makes sense but slowly 
you started shifting the, the user behavior uh, along those lines, right? And it takes a convergence of technology uh, sets to enable that, right? You had better penetration of internet, you had better um, uh, uh, companies that were leveraging the underlying technology, mobile technology evolved, right? Card reading processors involved, you had uh, PayPal, you have Square, you have uh, GPS, Google are kind of enabling a lot of those in real life transactions, right? Up until like 2012, 2013, people were not talking about FinTech as an example, right? People were not comfortable using uh, tapping uh, their card or so, you know, investing in robo advisors for that matter or ETFs. It's all kind of a recent phenomena in the in the side guide as far as mass uh, adoption is concerned. So bringing that back to the adoption of Web3 and a blockchain technology, I think that's where we are, where people are saying, no, why would we use this? Things already work, things already uh, are, are great as is. Like, why would I pay using my cryptocurrency uh, or um, my USDC or USDT dollar all, uh, already works? But what you really got to see is the underlying behavior of where people are spending majority of their time, which is in digitally native environments. So most of our credit card, debit cards are not currently set up to enable that fast digital interactions uh, globally, let alone just in the US or some uh, certain parts of the world. What blockchain as a technology behind the scenes solves for that is exactly that. You can be in anywhere, any part of the world, you can have any kind of transactions happen, any digital transaction that needs to happen can happen and be facilitated by this underlying technology. And what that will require is technology meeting us humans, consumers and users in spaces where we feel safe to begin with. It's not about creating entirely new experiences. It's about embedding the technology in the experiences that users are already participating in. Right? We always talk about uh, loyalty and rewards uh, with blockchain technology, but rewards and loyalty are not a technology problem. They are a marketing problem. So that means how can you leverage the technology to provide the same experience your Amex user or your airline user is having, but instead of using, I don't know, an AWS server or some other mechanism, replace it with a newer uh, technology uh, set, right? Like have the NFT be the front end experience, leverage um, like soft tokens to provide those rewards. Now these rewards could be, uh, you know, sent across multiple different parties, exchangeable across multiple different, um, you know, vendors. Users can send these rewards to other users and that's how you continue to advance and bring users into the fold without them even having to know or realize. That's very interesting. So to sum, uh, sum it up, what you're saying is that most of the, of the big jumps that we have in, uh, in the, the front end experience, the user experience, are the result uh, of what happens very slowly in the background, but most of it happens without the, the user to actually understand that the processor of what they're using has evolved or that the type of battery of their hardware has changed or that the algorithm has, has changed. They don't even notice it, but it happened gradually. And one day they realized how much everything has changed. Is that what you're yeah. meaning? Basically, yeah. That's wonderful. And so in terms of, uh, of your evolution, what are you guys at, um, you know, at, at Miston and what are the guys at SUI uh, looking at uh, in a few years? Oh, there's a lot of uh, verticals that are starting to come to life, right? Um, so this was back in 2017, 2018, where I, I started talking about the uh, technology convergence and was in Moscow at the World Blockchain Conference where um, I felt it was a bit early to talk about this but how I view the world, and I'll connect that to like how Sui is also looking at some of these different aspects, is a lot of it comes down to data and information. Because again, I'd, I had to do that, but I think it's important to know how we chart the course of our history as humans and how we kind of evolve. There are two fundamentally common themes that come across any new technological era. Uh, all the way from your cavemen to your medieval era to the technology uh, era, right? There's two things that we're really trying to uh, preserve. One is information and the other one is culture. All your technology that's being built to preserve is centered around these two things. Cavemen were writing and drawing in their caves, right? That preserved their culture, 
right? You had uh, the first book that was printed was a uh, Gutenberg Bible, right? Uh, what were you trying to preserve? A story, a cultural aspect, and an information. What were you trying to do with internet and computers? Preserve data, preserve information so that it can live forever, right? The same story we tell with Web3, no one can come and tamper your data and your information. What are we preserving? Our cultural aspects of who we are as humans. Now, if you bind that as your underlying thing, there are three converging technologies happening. Your IoTs, your blockchain, and your AI, right? IoTs could be your devices, your vision pros, your playstations, your whatever desktops you're working with. They collect information, right? On you, about you, wherever you are, what you're doing. Blockchain is the way to principally preserve that information in an immutable fashion. Right, so nothing could be argued because this is the way to store data and, um, and no one can go in and change it. AI will be used to augment on that data, right? To so combine all of these things together, that's what makes the future look really exciting. So what that does is bringing access to, leveraging obviously these technology sets, bringing access to real world assets for users that was previously not possible. Right now, like look at art. A lot of time art artists and arts come out and they say they have this art piece, but behind the scenes, if you go and look at it, they don't have any licenses, they don't have any consignment. And at the end, the users are, end up becoming holding the back, right? But if you can store all of this information, physical uh, data encoded on digital, now you know there's a provenance that exists between the physical and the digital world. And the user on the other side, when they're going to purchase the fraction of an art piece, they sure as hell know that this is uh, what they're purchasing, right? Um, similarly with AI and gaming. So gamification is a huge area um, of, of interest because a lot of the mundane tasks, AI will help empower it. So you will have your avatar or your digital identity that's working on your, on your behalf to create new experiences, new uh, new ideas, bringing that to life, creating more room for creativity, right? So convergence of AI and Web3 is massive. Bato is a great example. I don't know if you know of this. This is a generative AI platform that has a token called Bato. And every week, a new art piece gets created, gets sold on super rare, and all the proceeds, uh, majority of the proceeds from that sale goes back to the uh, the, uh, the holders and the DAO uh, uh, members of of Bardo itself. So that's where we are evolving as like. Humans. Wow, I, I love that mm -hmm. one. You know, because um, I, I have been a film producer that was in another life, uh, yeah. and well, being sympathetic, you know, uh, towards all these ideas, um, uh, cypherpunk ideas, and everything, I'm always rather unfavorable to all these laws that people are proposing in order to, you know, counter the fact that AI has been trained by artists, so we should tax AI. I don't think this is what's going to happen. If we tax AI, the people who are going to uh, to get rich are not the artists, but the people who basically collect the taxes or invent them. That's always what happens. Most of the time, uh, a, a few artists get funded and say, oh, look at that. Uh, what a luck, how lucky we are to have this program. But let's face it, most of the artists do not get a bite of that cake. And most of the time, the, the biggest bite goes to the collector. And, and that's why I kind of like what you're saying here, because it means that we could have a genuinely decentralized system that could also be used for artists to say, to say, we don't exactly know who trained the AI. Everyone is kind of responsible for the baby it produced. And it's okay. Here's a community benefit because you have contributed in your own way. And that's, that's something to, uh, to balance the uncertainty and to still um, give a, a decent wage without having a centralized government giving, giving subsidies to artists. So I, I really like the, the tech you're talking about. This is, yeah. this is wonderful. And, 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 and one other thing I would just add on just to complete that whole thought is around the decentralized physical infrastructure. And it means different things to different people. But they, what, the absolutely brilliant thing about this is this, right? It's a very simple use case. So if you're like a Tesla owner, right? All your information, for instance, is stored already. It exists, right? Imagine if you could, if you're selling your Tesla, um, and your in insurance information is available, all the vendors that you've worked with over the years, whether it be your battery supplier or your maintenance guy or 
whatever else that comes with it is already stored there. Now I sell, you sell the Tesla to me, instead of me having to establish, reestablish new relationship with all the vendors, all of these vendor relations come to me. So I'm not only paying to purchase your car, but it reduces a lot of overhead for me to go and search for new uh, supplies, right? I can get it and I can prove it, yes, that this is the person is connected with. And the, on the other side, the vendor really doesn't have to care because all they really care about is the, is, is the car and how it gets maintained. They have all the information. And NFT as a technology can easily substitute for what we have as kind of a paper trail and like information being stored. Yeah, in Clerks and notaries and everything like that. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I really think that this is the future, for example, of real estate. Um, in France, notably, when you buy a home, you have to pay two, let's say you pay your home to 100,000 euros, you will have to give 15,000 euros to, um, to a, uh, you know, a lawyer who then yeah. is going to give three quarters of that to the state uh, just to make sure that there is a logical chain of owners and I totally think that this is going to be a very um, a very strong use case uh, use case in the future um, and indeed I, I like the fact that you guys are building something very satisfying in that direction and yeah. so are there other projects that you're not working on yourself but that inspired you there's quite a lot of projects out in the space that are really are doing interesting stuff, right? Um, I think, especially in the um, NFT space, um, there's Pudgy Penguins is a great example, like how they have captured like a mind share, uh, how they're building things ground up in a very thoughtful manner. All right, they started off as um, just as an NFT PFP collection, then Luca who came in and kind of overtook as the CEO has started putting a lot of strategic bets, um, creating an entire entertainment and media industry behind it and capturing the attention uh, of its user and continuing to expand it, right? Their partnership with Walmart, uh, they're building new games using the NFTs that they have, providing special access to uh, projects. I think that is super interesting. Um, and some of the other things that I, I, I uh, that I found interesting about that project specifically is like how uh, they're not hyper focused on just NFTs and PFPs as being front and center thing, but what are the adjacent businesses that can be created, right? Um, so that's definitely one of the projects that I really uh, look at get an inspiration from. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely in that one. Thank you so much. I was super inspired to have you on board. Any last word, any last comment you want, uh, want to make um, about the, the whole blockchain sector these days? No, look, I mean, it's very easy to discount things uh, in the blockchain and Web3 space when you're just looking at the price uh, momentum, the movement, right? Uh, I've been through three cycles at this point. I've seen the ups <laughs> and downs in like so many different ways. When the bear comes, people get really scared and everyone, whoever the tourists, they escape. But people who are building, people who believe in this technology, they stay and they keep pushing the ball, uh, you know, the envelope uh, expanding every single cycle. Um, so I think it's important to stay patient, build on things that really matter, but at the same time, have fun. Right, meme coins, NFTs, PFPs, they all have their place. They bring in new users because people uh, enjoy the social aspect that comes with it. Uh, make money while doing so. Nobody's, uh, there's no, um, nothing wrong with it, right? And if, if that's what brings people in, kind of explore and provide, uh, you know, have additional touch points in the Web3, then so be it. There's no one simple equation to do it. And kudos to all the builders who have stuck around and continue to build on to bulls and bears. And, uh, would love to find a way to work, uh, you know, uh, either in present capacity or, you know, through Sui and Mr. Labs, always looking to find interesting and inspiring uh, founders and projects to work with. Thank you so much, Rohan. Everyone, this was Rohan Honda from Mr. Labs. This was Mutual Knowledge Systems podcast. Please subscribe, like, share, and go look at what they're doing at Mr. Labs. Thank you so much, Rohan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gautier.